I was saved 33 years ago. I came to Christ out of a world, a life of darkness, and, and I was saved in a, in a, in a, in a Southern Baptist church, and, and look, I went to Sunday school in the morning, and, and I went to church Sunday morning, and, and I'd go back Sunday night, and, and if I wasn't on duty at the time, I'd go back on Wednesday, and, and like going from a world of darkness, like knowing nothing, like nothing, to, and I started to learn things, and I was excited because I was learning things, and, and I didn't feel so stupid when my friends would talk about Jesus, and, and I wasn't afraid because I'd never heard of Jesus, and, and, but you know what I found after a while? That learning was just learning. That learning didn't apply to living. And I got dry. And I'm like, this Jesus that we're talking about, I don't even know who he is. Like what you're telling me and what I'm living don't match. And then I'd fall away. I'd fall away in the season of dryness. And then after a while of separation, I'd, 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 out of emotional, and I'm like, well, I need to go back. And I'd go back. Same lessons, same, how's it going? And, and I would get so dry. And then I quit going. Because what they're telling me and what I'm living were two different things. And then it became a vicious cycle of just this binge purge, binge purge. And after about 10 years of that, I went to a visit at a spirit-filled church. I'd never been there. And I walked in, and, and of course, the first person I see is a lady who I never met in my life, but I know she hated me. Like she said bad things about me because my position as a, as a police officer and an arrest that had been made and a family member. And I'm like, I just want to visit. I don't need your drama. And she comes up and she puts her hands on the side of my head and she starts praying. Except I don't know what she's saying. And she's praying and I'm just trying to be nice. Like, I just don't want drama, right? I mean, I get it during the week. I just want to go home and go to lunch. And, and all of a sudden, the words, I start to understand them. She's speaking in tongues. And I begin to understand that it's not her words. It's God speaking to me. And, and then I realize that it's the gift of interpretation. And with that fell the, the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to tell you, when she finished praying, and she's like, she goes, will you forgive me? I don't even know you. And I'm like, yeah. And she started praying again. And listen, and it's all I could do. She was literally physically holding me up by these two ears on the side of my head. I was so slain in the spirit. And after that moment, my life had never been the same. I had been indwelled by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Jesus that they had been talking about became the Jesus that I became intimately connected to without the baptism of the holy spirit we got we don't have the life this book this is just literature without the power of the holy spirit as we continue our walk through the gospel of mark today we're going to talk about the baptism the baptism of jesus but what i want to tell you is that jesus's ministry was only activated after the baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And yours will be too. If you're living a life that feels dry, academic, educational, you feel like, like this, this well is just like dry literature, you need an encounter with the living God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Your ministry, your life, your fire, is only activated by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So I will ask us if we'll stand as the body as we continue to read and work through the Gospel of Mark. Let's read the only word that gives us the true fire for life. And we'll read this as the body, and it comes from Mark 1, 9 through 13 as our anchor scripture. And we'll read together. John baptizes Jesus. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately, coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. That is a good word.
Thank you, Lord. That is what launched the ministry of Jesus. What I want to share with you is that Jesus began his earthly ministry with a symbolic death and water baptism, symbolic burial, and resurrection. Jesus began his heavenly ministry with an actual death, an actual burial, and an actual resurrection. You see, Jesus' baptism, it brought the Holy Spirit down to indwell in him and empowered his ministry. Jesus' ascension sent the Holy Spirit down to indwell in you and empower your ministry. You see, Jesus shows submission to God by submitting to baptism, to submitting to John for baptism. Remember we've talked before and we talked about Ephesians, that the word submission, it's from the Greek, hupotasso. Hupa means placing yourself under, like God, like Jesus placed himself under the will of the Father. And tasso is a military word, meaning uh, ordered and structured. Jesus submitted himself to John the Baptist for baptism. John the baptism, John the Baptist served a ministry role by baptizing Jesus. What I want to share is sometimes in our lives, oftentimes in our lives, our ministry may be to elevate someone to the next level in their ministry. Sometimes we, we you know, they say that comparison is the thief of joy. We're like, well, my ministry's not as big as their ministry, and they've got a microphone strapped to their face, and, well, I'm just over here waving at people in the parking lot. Like, don't compare your God job to the other God jobs. Do your God job. We talked about it before. At the time, John the Baptist was like the first Christian church mega pastor. He says all Judea, all Jerusalem came out to see him. That's about 70,000 people. But all he was meant to do was to point people to the, to the king, to King Jesus. Don't compare what God's asked you to do to anyone else. Be obedient to God's will and serve a purpose that is usually greater than your personal expectations. And what I want to encourage is be careful not to self-activate. If you're moving into a ministry and you're outside of God's uh, will, then you're going to be outside of God's favor. You're going to struggle. You're going to feel dry. Had John the Baptist been like, no, 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 I know, I know, I know, but, but like, like, don't unsubscribe from my mailing list, right? No, then John falls out, but John didn't fall out. John did his job. John was there to help elevate and move Jesus' ministry from glory to glory. And then in Mark 1:11, then a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Like this would be the first recorded time that God the Father speaks to Jesus the Son since he became flesh. Imagine 30 years, 30 years, and then your dad gives verbal affirmation. It's so important for us to receive God the Father's affirmation. Dads, dads, your wives and your kids, they seek, they need your verbal affirmation. You are good, good fathers. The people in our lives need our affirmation. So I want to go to the next part, which is the, the, when Satan tempts Jesus. And the rest of this message, I want to focus on this, because this is where the Lord led me to focus upon. And we're going to go into 12, and it says, The Spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness, where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. He was out among the wild animals, and the angels took care of him. It's important. We, we spent 17 weeks in Ephesians talking about building character and, and then the armor of God and, and standing firm against the wiles of the devil. And, and, and it's so important to understand who we're dealing with. We've got to know the enemy. Otherwise, we're just throwing fists flailing in the air. We're accomplishing nothing. So just to clear up, because we do, we get this all the time. And, and when it comes to, to demonic oppression or possession or suppression, there's, there's, some, there's some controversy. But the question is, can a believer be demon-oppressed? And the answer is yes. Was Jesus oppressed by Satan? Yes. And if you don't believe that he was, then you don't believe the word of the Lord because the word of the Lord just said he was tempted by Satan. It didn't mean he was just in the same space. Jesus was tempted by Satan. That temptation is oppression. Now, was Jesus possessed? No. 
Can a believer be possessed? No. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have received the Holy Spirit. You are 100% filled with the Holy Spirit. There is no room for demons. But in the Bible, it's, it's about legal authority. So you buy your property. That property belongs to you. You have legal, a property, a legal authority over that property. Now, does that mean that a squatter can't come and set up a tent at the end of that property? They can. Do they have legal authority to be there? No. Do you have the right to evict them? Yes, and you should. Demons have no legal authority. God has legal authority over you. Why? Because his son paid for you. He bought you. The Holy Spirit has filled you. But it's still important going forward for the rest of this message and, the rest, and, and in our walks to understand that we can be oppressed by demonic forces. You know, so here's Jesus. You think about this. And, and in Mark, it's just two sentences. It's pretty brief. And we're going to jump over to Luke in a little bit. But you think about this. Here's Jesus. He sees his cousin, John. Hey, cuz. He gets water baptized. He comes out. Remember when you got slain by the Holy Spirit for the first time? He gets filled by the Holy Spirit. And then God, his Father, affirms him. Like, how amazing is that? This is a mountaintop experience in our life. Bam, immediately, he is compelled, driven into the wilderness for 40 days, where he is tempted by Satan. It's like, what gives? Like, what gives? Life was so good. How did it go to here? How many times do we find ourselves in those situations? Mountaintop moments? Look, Satan's lost, but it doesn't mean he likes losing. What better way to knock you off a mountain is when you're on the mountain? You see, I'll tell you, Moses, in Moses' mountaintop experience with the Lord, he came down to find what? The entire nation had thrown a party and built a golden calf. The disappointment he must have felt. Paul, Paul was, re was receiving such deep revelation from the Lord. That, that Satan sent a demon to, to, to tempt him, to distract him. And you know, poor Peter. Like Peter wins the prize from peak to pit in record time. Like you go to Matthew 16, and here's Jesus. He's like, but who do you say that I am? And oh, Peter, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. Like this is Peter. And Jesus is like, that's my boy. Good going, Peter. And then Jesus shares about, about his coming, uh, cr uh, crucifixion, resurrection, ascent. And then Peter chastises him. And what does Jesus say right after that? Get behind me, Satan. Like this is Jesus the Christ. Get behind me, Satan. So Peter wins the prize from peak to pit in record time. Don't be surprised when you get these mountaintop experiences that the devil's not waiting to trip you up on the way down but you know how you defend that you adorn yourself in the full armor of god let's face the reality satan is going to attack you because you're on team jesus and if you're like well then i just won't i just won't worship god i'll just lay under the radar then you're serving satan like there's no neutral ground there's no neutral ground you're either serving King Jesus or you're serving Satan. I'm sorry to tell you, but there's no neutral ground. Too many times people are like, it's just too hot. Just things are crazy right now. Like, I'm going to sit out for a little bit. Y'all, this is the fourth quarter of the championship game. There's no fifth quarter in this game. This is it. You sit on that bench, you miss out on the victory. So let's understand a little bit more about Satan as, it's, as he's described in this encounter with Jesus. Like Satan is who he is. Devil, as an adverb, is what he does. Now, a lot of times the word Satan and devil are interchanged. Devil can be used as a noun, and often is. But in this context, Satan is who he is. Devil is what he does. Because the word devil in Greek is diabolos. And that means slanderer. 
And as a slanderer, what the slanderer does, it's a persistent pounding, 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 pounding. You see, you're a strong tower. You're standing for the Lord. And to breach that tower, to breach that, that position that you hold for the kingdom, takes a pounding and a pounding and a pounding and a pounding. That's what the slanderer does. The slanderer continues to pound you. To p- and what is he pounding? Your mind. Because that's the battlefield. That's what a slanderer does. What is he slandering your life with right now? You're too old. You're too weak. You're too slow. You're too poor. You're too dumb. You're too scared. You're too this. You're too that. Nobody's going to love you. No wonder they left you. Nobody's going to hire you. No wonder you're this. This, these are lies. These are lies from the father of lies. I would rather just take a punch in the face, like a physical punch in the face. Let's get it over with. But you know what affects me and it affects you is the pounding and the pounding and the pounding and the lies that the father of lies is constantly telling you. You know why? Because like we've shared before, the, the word um, stand against the wiles, the wiles in the Greek is, is uh, methodos or methodos. And it means one way. The devil has one way, one road, one trick into your life. And it's into your mind. That's why we say that you've got to put on the helmet of salvation. And it can't be like a bucket on your head. It is wrapped tight. A warrior's helmet is tight on their head, tied with a bill, a visor, and a bill behind, jaw protection to to prevent any kind of cheap shots. You've got to put on the helmet of salvation. Your mind is a battlefield. And look, I know a lot of times we're like, oh, I want, I just want to have an emotional reaction. Like I want to feel some Jesus. I just want to be happy. And I get that. But the war is won in your mind. You want to be happy? Get your mind right for Christ. Now, Emotions will come as a manifestation of winning your war against Satan. But that war is not going to be won with happy wishes and rainbows. That war is won by renewing your mind. We talk about Romans 12, 2, 12, 2, 12, 2. That should be seared in your mind because that's the winning strategy. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do not be conformed to this world. Who is the God of this world? Satan. Little g. Temporary. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? There's a lot of ways to renew your mind. You can watch TV. You can watch radio. You can listen to people. You can look at memes on Facebook. Or you can go to the source. You can go to the word of the Lord. But I'm going to tell you, the slanderer is not going to stop. It's not going to stop. It's not going to stop. But you put that, you put the helmet of salvation. It even defended against the most lethal weapon at that time, which was the battle axe. It was an axe that would literally crush your skull with one blow. A stab, you can survive it. A jab, you can survive it. But a battle axe to the head, you're dead. You're dead. That helmet that the warriors wore defended that. The helmet of salvation that God gives you to put on, it defends against that. The devil's not going to give you a break because times are tough. What you do is you stand from your position of authority. You see, we think we're coming from defeat and we've got to walk into the light. You're already in the light. You're already in the light. All those slanderous allegations that are made, those rumors and gossips, that's just nothing. But I want you to understand who the enemy is. I want you to understand who he is so we can appreciate what Jesus is going through. So when, so when Mark continues and he tells the story and, and, and he says uh, about Jesus' temptation, and, and actually only in Mark's gospel does he mention that Jesus is amongst the wild beast. It says, immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness... And he was there in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Like Mark's gospel, Matthew and Luke or John, neither one, none of the three mention wild beasts. 
What Mark is doing is he's setting the atmosphere, he's setting the environment. Because let's not, I don't want you to misunderstand when it's like Jesus is in the wilderness. It's like we've been in the wilderness, we've been camping. There was an Airbnb or a Hotel Six. I mean, there was something. Like this is nothing. Nothing. Jesus is completely exposed to the natural elements. There's no shelter. There's no food. There's no water. There's no bed. All around Jesus. Just seconds from being water baptized, Holy Spirit indwelled, and fatherly affirmed, he finds himself in the middle of nothing. Nothing. All around him, including wild beasts. It's like if it ain't enough for the sun, if it ain't enough because there's no food, if it ain't enough because there's no water, now they got all these wild beasts around me. Let me tell you what Mark's doing. Mark's connecting Jesus to Adam. You see, Jesus is the second Adam. Adam came in the flesh, was corrupted, created the fall of humanity. Jesus came in the spirit, is the redemption of humanity. Mark doesn't imply that Jesus was in danger from the natural threats of the beast. He simply said, there were wild beasts. You see, you know why Jesus was not in danger? Because he had authority and dominion over those wild beasts. The same as Adam when he was in the garden. Actually, Adam named all the beasts, if you recall. Mark is giving the description of the atmosphere that Jesus finds himself in. But Jesus is, is not, it doesn't say that he's in danger of the wild beast. Our natural mind goes, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? What's going to get him? In the supernatural, you realize he's got dominion and authority over those things. Never once says he's in danger. You see, Adam, amongst the beast, was in no danger. He also had authority and dominion in the garden. Satan was no threat to Adam. Adam was a threat to Adam. Adam was failure for humanity. See, I want to tell you, the devil, the Satan, he's no threat to you. Unless you become a threat to yourself. Unless you step out of the will of God, the favor of God, the cover of God. Then you become a threat to you. Satan was no threat to Jesus. Jesus was a threat to Satan. Where Adam fall, corruption, failed for humanity. Jesus just came out of that wilderness. Jesus was the redemption for humanity. You see, both of them. When Adam was in the garden and Jesus in the wilderness, they were both in the presence of God and supernatural beings. Adam exited Eden and entered the world in sin. Jesus exited the wilderness to redeem the world of sin. Just to confirm this, I want to read from 1 Corinthians 15. And this is from the NLT. It said, the scripture tells us the first man, Adam, became a living person. But the last Adam, that is Christ, is a living, life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body, and then the spirit body comes out later. Adam was the first man and was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man, and heavenly people are like the heavenly man. Just as we are now like earthly man, we will one someday become like the heavenly man. Mark, in that simple sentence, as I believe, by by saying that Jesus was amongst the wild beasts, connects Jesus to Adam. The garden was the original prototype. The garden is the original design. The garden was meant to be perfection. We are coming back to the garden. Everything brings back to the garden. So I want you to win your war. So in reading this message, and, and I always share with you, like, like, be a detective. Be an investigator when you're reading God's Word. Don't just read it to check off a block. Today's daily devotional. Check. I got it done. Like, read. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you something that I've never seen before. Like some of the saddest things I hear talking to people, they're like, oh man, I've read that a thousand times. Read it a thousand and one, but ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you something you've never seen before. And I want to share with you from Luke 4, 13. It says, now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Now, a lot of times I've read that, I'm like, oh, Meshach, good. He left that old boy alone. He left him alone. But when you pray and you ask the Holy Spirit, what I want you to see, you see, the Scripture says the devil had ended every temptation. It does not say each temptation. It says every temptation. You see, the devil did everything he had to tempt Jesus. Like he emptied all of his ammo 
He threw his knife and his stick and his cell phone that he didn't have insurance for. Like the devil, everything he had, the kitchen sink he threw at Jesus. And then he departed. What I want you to understand is that this is, this is revelation into the enemy's battle plan. If you're a sports fan, and let's say the Dallas Cowboys, and, and if the Cowboys knew the plays that the other team was going to run, they would have a winning season. If I knew it was a pass or a run, or the, if I knew their plan, I'm guaranteed victory. You know the devil's plan. You're guaranteed victory. Why? Because this scripture tells us. And I want to emphasize, because sometimes we're like, each, every, ended, departed. In the Greek, let's look at the Greek. In the Greek, the word for Greek, it means for ended, means to be terminated. To be terminated. Not set aside or unplugged. Terminated. Done. The word every in the Greek, past, it means all, whole, entire. Like, I want you to get it. Like, when it says every, that's everything he had. He threw at Jesus. And what are these three things that he throws at Jesus? I want you to win your war. His three weapons are provision, power, and protection. This is what Satan used against Jesus. This is what Satan uses against you. Provision, power power, protection. He wants you to believe that he is the only one that can provide for you. He is the only one that if you do this, we're going to pay your bills. If you do this, you're going to have, you're going to have power. You're going to have authority on this earth. If you do this for me, if you just worship me, you're going to fall under my protection. Ain't nobody going to mess with you ever again. This is what Satan wants you to believe. If I'm going to appeal to somebody's natural senses and I promise you provision and power and protection, you're probably going to be like, yeah, sounds good to me. Who doesn't want that? Satan wants you to believe he's the only one that can provide these things for you. But you see, Satan's a liar. He's not just a liar. He's the father of lies. But this is what he's using on Jesus. This is what he's using on you. And listen, it's all he's got. Now, let me, be, let me make sure I'm clear. He doesn't have um, the ability to give you provision or to give you power or to give you protection. These are creative, positive things. He can't create anything. He can, he can give a false illusion. Only God can provide for you. Only God gives you power. Only God gives you protection. All Satan can do is lie to you. And I want to, show, I want to illustrate this to you. So this is the battle plan. When it says Satan threw everything he got, this is all he's got. This is it. Let's go back to wiles of the devil. One way, one road, one path. That's all he's got. Attack your mind. So this is, this is we're going to look at Luke for this. Mark was a little light in his two sentences. And it's the if it battle. If, I-F, it, I-T battle. You see, Satan uses sleight of tongue with God's word the same way he did with Eve. You want to you manipulate? You want to slander? You want to try to get something over on somebody? Keep it as close to the truth as you can and give it a little bit of manipulation. Same thing he did to Eve. Satan's deception, I'm going to tell you, it's unnoticeable without spiritual discernment. If you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit and you're not praying for discernment and you're not listening to the word of the Lord when you're in these situations, without spiritual discernment, you're going to fall for this stuff. You see, Jesus uses, I mean, Satan uses scripture, but he adds that little doubt with the word if. It's just a little bitty word. Like how much damage can it do? But Jesus counters with a, a definitive it. So here's the first weapon that, that Satan uses. One of the three, provision. And he says, and the devil said to him, if, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. What Jesus was doing, he was quoting scripture. He was quoting uh, from Deuteronomy 8, 3. 
It says, yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry, then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and by your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by the word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. You know, it's when we, when we fast and we're like, well, I try to diet. You know, I start in the morning, and by 10, 15, I've already eaten a whole box of cereal and a pint of ice cream. Like, I can't diet. But 30 days later in a fast, there's no hunger. The intention is, when you're fasting, you're relying on the word of the Lord to be your your food, to be your bread. You see, this is what the Lord says. And you see, if Jesus, who came to do only his Father's will, used the power of his Father for his personal benefit to get himself a little bread, then Jesus really isn't doing the will of the Father. He's doing it for his personal needs. And I want to offer this as a challenge to you, that that if you find yourself in a situation where you can do something to further the kingdom of the Lord, if the Holy Spirit says, do this, and you're like, "Mm, well, I could sell that. I could keep that money. And I could, uh, I could go on a vacation. There's nothing wrong with selling things and money and vacation. But if the word of the Lord says, why don't you give this to somebody? Take that as an opportunity to do the Father's will. Take that as an opportunity to not turn a stone into bread for your personal benefit. And then the second, the second weapon that the devil has, well, that he thinks he has, is power. This is the second temptation of Christ. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Jesus is quoting again, Deuteronomy 6.13. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. What I want to share with you is when Satan says, worship before me, it might be like, well, I mean, I mean, like, I don't know. Like, is a little, is a little Satan that bad? Like, if I return the text message from the, from the girl at the gym? Or, well, you know, my boss calls me his work wife. Maybe we'll go to lunch. I mean, I don't know. Like, it's so late at night. Nobody's going to know if I watch a little pornography. Like, how bad can worshiping a little Satan be? But you see, in the Greek, the, the, the phrase worship before me, what it means is that he was telling Jesus to kiss his hand in reverence of him, and then for Jesus to lay himself on the ground prostrate before Satan. Can you imagine Jesus, the Christ, laid on the ground like a dog before Satan? What I'm telling you is, when Satan tempts you, with just a little bit of Satan. What he's doing is, he wants you to humiliate yourself before him and before the witness of the Lord. There is no such thing as just a little bit of Satan. There's no such thing as that. So when he tells Jesus, worship before me, and Jesus counters it. Satan wants your full humiliation before him. You see, Satan offered Jesus human rule and reign over all the natural kingdoms. Like, this is all yours. And he says, I can give it to whoever I wish. You know what? He wasn't lying. He wasn't lying. You see, when Adam fell, he had the keys, dominion and authority. He surrendered that to who? To Satan. Satan ain't lying. He could have given it to him. Legal authority over natural kingdoms, you see. If only Jesus would bow down and he would become earthly king. He could overthrow the Romans. That's what everybody wanted him to do anyway. Why not just do it? And then people would love him because we know that how great, you know, oh, we love you until somebody else. But Jesus, you know what? Oh my gosh. Jesus could have avoided crucifixion. He wouldn't have had to go through all that stuff if he had just done what Satan did. He could have been king of the world. You know what I want to tell you? People do the same thing. John 6, 15. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Like these are people 
who were going to force Jesus into kingship. Why were they wanting to do that? For their own personal gain. What I want to tell you is that personal elevation by manipulation is not assigned by God. Personal elevation by force is not assigned by God. Do not allow others to guilt or force or encourage you into a new assignment until you're ready and it's affirmed by God. What I want to tell you is get off that mountain if that top's not yours. The third piece and the final thing that Satan's got to use against you is protection. And he says, then he brought him Jesus, he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You see, Satan, he's quoting God to God. He's quoting God to To God. But I want to tell you. If you've ever had your words used against you. Most of us have. Make sure the words you speak from the origin. Are always words uh, that are righteous. And have integrity. You see Satan is trying to use God's word against God. But reverence for God is required. To use God's words in reverence. Anybody can vomit scripture. A lot of times we'll find people in our lives who will use scripture. Just go to social media for one minute and you'll see people twisting and turning and manipulating scripture. You check the fruit, you check the heart, and you check what they got to see. And is it coming from reverence or out of manipulation? So I want to put these things up on the board. This This is wilderness survival. Did Jesus survive that temptation in the wilderness? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Was he tempted? Yes, he was. How did he survive? Knowing the word of the Lord. This is what I want to share with you. You will find yourself in the wilderness. Some of us have already been there. Some of us are there. Some of us are going back. You will find yourself in the wilderness. You will be tempted by Satan. Why? Because you're a child of God. Because you chose to serve Team Jesus. You must resist the wiles of the devil by putting on the whole armor of God. You can't just grab a shield or a shoe or a belt or a sword. You've got to put on the whole armor of God. You must know God's word to counter Satan's use of God's word. Jesus was in an if-it encounter. If Jesus didn't know the it, then Satan would win with the if. You've got to know the word of the Lord. You will find yourself in dangerous places surrounded by natural and supernatural enemies. But I want to assure you, you have God's authority and dominion over everything. You will come out of these hard times only if you walk in God's righteousness. Listen, a lot of us go through the wilderness. You're going to go through the wilderness. But not everybody comes out of the wilderness. An entire nation perished in the wilderness. Your wilderness is not to punish you, but to prepare you for promotion. I know it doesn't feel like it. I know you feel like God's never been further away from you. I know you feel like like you're all alone and and you're just almost, almost resistant and angry at God. But it's not to punish you. It's to prepare you. And you know, your trials and temptations are the weight of resistance used by God to increase your faith and power. You know, you want to get stronger? You got to go to the gym. You got to lift heavy things. You want to be smarter? You've got to go to classes and study difficult things. You want to be wiser? You've got to face challenges that, 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 that really do, that put you to the test. This is what the wilderness will do for you. But, and the one thing that the Lord put on my heart is that it all begins by the back back activation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit there's no shortcuts there's no shortcuts and I'll tell you this is where Satan comes that's the battle plan those are the only three weapons the only three pieces of ammunition that he has 
You now know this. You know, you know how to defeat this. That's all he's got, y'all. He's not going to come up with number four because that would require creating a number four option. He cannot create anything. He can only kill, steal, and destroy. I want you to win your war against Satan. I want you to win your battle. Winning that war, winning that battle means knowing who your enemy is. Means knowing what his method of attack is. He's a slanderer. He's a slanderer. He's a slanderer. And he's going to penetrate and penetrate and penetrate till he breaks through and he's in your mind and he begins controlling your thoughts and controlling your decisions. But you're impenetrable because you've got God. You've got the armor of God. And now you've got his game plan. If you start worrying about power and provision and protection, understand you've got one source, God the Father, 